Hello, hello, everybody. My name is Alex, otherwise known as Lexi. Welcome to the LGL officially unofficial cast. We're going to cover the first four games of the LJL that happened this week. That's week four. We're actually halfway through the season. And we'll be officially halfway through after the first four games. As always, I'm your host. But I, of course, am joined by my lovely color commentator and play-by-play -play caster, Initialize and Nymera. Please, as always, introduce yourselves. Uh, yeah, I'm Sam Initialize Hapgood, and I will happily be bringing you the magic today as your play-by-play -play caster. Yeah, and I'm Alex Nymera Hapgood, and I'm uh, yeah pretty excited to be back at it after a slight delay in our broadcast and stuff. Got some really good games coming today. Actually. I'm looking forward to them. Yeah, it was uh, definitely a, a day or two later than normally scheduled and planned for us over here, but uh, technical difficulties, while they might pr stop us momentarily, it doesn't stop us like anything else we will continue <laughs> we'll be back with a vengeance and more content more content that doesn't the stream stop is like Callista and could keep going back it's fine. <laughs> yeah yeah we're we are eternal um i think one of <laughs> that's a like... terrifying thought he wants to sleep at some point uh, hmm. okay gonna maybe not do more jojo references like that mm. okay okay so our first four games that we're going to be covering today over here on the LJL officially unofficial is going to be our first and opening game is going to be the Fukuoka Softbank Hawks Gaming versus Axis. Following that one, we're going to have Sengoku Gaming face off against Axis as well. Following that one, it'll be Sengoku versus V3 Esports. And then to round us out for the day, it's going to be V3 Esports versus the Fukuoka Softbank Hawks Gaming. Gentlemen, First match, SoftBank versus Axis. Um, well, I mean, Axis has the momentum at the moment, right? Um, but and the Hawks, my Hawks, they're they had a really uh, mm, concerning week. Yeah, and for me, actually, the story of all four of the games we're casting today is blood in the water. Each of these teams has something to prove. Each of them have looked shaky at points in the last week or two. Um, I think particularly in this first game, Axis picked up the first win. They look very good in their other game of that week as well. And there are going to be a lot of question marks over the Hawks as to whether they can, you know, regain their form. They're now 3-3 three and three coming into this mm. week. Uh, they're not particularly looking too healthy about, um, you know, their team compositions have been a bit back and forth in a couple of things. So I'm looking to see if Axis can really capitalize on this Hawks roster, which has not found its footing in the last week. Mm. Yeah, I think for me as well, there's been a, there's been issues with the Hawks and the other team that I kind of we might talk about a little bit later. With Sengoku, had a similar issue where they hit the mid game and just have no agency or feel like they were a little bit lost on the map. Uh, and particularly with the Hawks, they sort of just uh, got a bit rumbled in draft in one game, and then the other one they just just didn't do a lot. Post about 15 minutes. Yeah, and that was just a concerning thing. They seemed to be fine in the early mid game, almost regardless of their draft. It was mm. once the game actually started coming together after that 15 minute mark that you hit on initialize that it all just fell apart for the, my Hawks. But Axis, let's talk about them. They got their first win going into week three. They were 0 and 4. And now they've picked up their first one. And in both games, actually, of last week, they Looks looked really good. very strong. Yeah. And. Uh, Corporal was actually one of our players of the week for me and Initialize, I believe. Yeah, in the support yeah, position. I really rate yes, support in us. Yeah, yeah, and and Nightmare was still very complimentary in our, yeah, in our I, podcast. I, I, yeah, <laughs> plug plug one. Yeah, no, I yeah, I, I know that you guys are really high on Corporal. I thought he had a great week as well. It kind of broke my heart a little bit not to vote for him, but I thought Gang also had a really yeah, good week. So true. whatever, right? Anyway, but congrats then, to him as well, and the, uh, whole the whole of team access. of Axis. Yeah, yeah, the whole of Axis did so well that week, so um, a worthy recipient of our uh, role of the week for support. I mean, I wanted to give it to the whole team for player <laughs> of the week, because I was like, man, this is just such a lovely showing. This has gone from like a... They're like doing the Golden Guardians right now, and I'm actually really happy about it. If they, if they can keep going, that's Golden Guardians, because everyone expects them to be last, <laughs> and now they're mid-table, and Liquid, or Liquid be, would be DFM, and that would be a really, really shocking thing to have happened. <laughs> What a Imagine weird if world Axis were higher on the table than DFM. Oof. But I mean, we're saying this, they've only got the one win so far, so they're going to have to uh, get a, pick up a couple of more Ws. Yeah, exactly. The, the playoff dream is not dead yet, but they have some work to do. And last week, they, we, we, we were 
Or over the first couple of weeks, we rather we were <sighs> rightly quite worried about their mid-game positioning, their mid-game vision control, what they were doing. They seemed to tighten that up coming into week three, had a lot stronger showing in the mid-game. Just now, the late game, it was that what the, the one game they did lose, they're going to feel a little bit a little bit upset about they could absolutely have won that, but some late game positioning from a couple key members got them punished. And we can sort of see the growing pains of this team that is coming together actually a little bit now, but whether it's too little too late, we'll have to see. So, moving forward throughout our quick ones, we have got some very exciting games to come up. Obviously, Sengoku as well, V3 Esports as well to be playing off. Should be some interesting games. Any quick thoughts on those matchups that we've got seeing? Any exciting ones, you guys? Yeah, I think V3 are looking to uh, maybe break out a 2 in a week today rather than a one-on-one -on -one as they've done in every other week so far. I think, again, V3 and Sengoku, they have a lot to prove. They've not had perfect games, but they have had their strengths on display in a lot of the games they've been playing. You know, V3 had some very explosive games. Boogie been an absolute standout jungler. Uh, whereas Sengoku, they just need to find their consistency, really. They, um, they've they had some very shaky mid-games, even when they've had somewhat of a draft advantage. They haven't necessarily played to their win conditions, so I'd love to see them have a very clear composition and play to it. That would be my goal for them this week, and see if they can pull off two games uh, to get them up in the standings. Yeah, I think I, think I echo you there, actually. I think V3 is a really good call, uh, but for me, I want to be looking at... Um, very much at Boogie because it feels like when Boogie doesn't get an advantage in the early game, mm, V3 yeah. fall apart. Yeah. Every game they've lost, it's largely been off the fact that Boogie's been a bit of a non-factor or struggling. Um, and that, that you know, living by Boogie, dying by Boogie. I mean, they're the worst players to be living and dying by. The man's a fantastic jungler. But I need to see a little bit more consistency from the rest of the members to be able to step up when Boogie is not having as strong a game. Uh, and for, say, Ngoku, I think my issue will be, like, I want to see them on the front foot. Like, they actually picked a composition last week where they went for Ash, Malzahar, really clear, pick, hard engage, uh, or at least hard hard CC, uh, and never got to use it on the front foot. We're getting dived on instead. Yep. Uh, so I'd really like to see them kind of be a little bit pro more proactive around that 10 to 15 minute mark and start taking the fight to their opponents and trying to bring their compositions to bear in, in a more uh, proactive way. Absolutely. But with that all said, let's get into our first game, Axis versus the Fukuoka SoftBank Hawks Gaming. Gonna be a good one, but as always, as it is the LJL, it's a blast from the past, so we're gonna count us very quickly in, in three, two, one. Good luck to both of the teams. All right, thank you very much, Mass One, and we are absolutely into draft. So let's run down some of these rosters. On the blue side with Axis, it is Uenyan in the top lane, Hoglet in the jungle, Gariaru in mid, and Hyde and Corporal as their bot lane respectively. And on the red side, it's the SoftBank Hawks in the top lane. It's Dash in the jungle. It's Tussle in the mid lane, Ramane, and in the bot lane, Honey and Pooh. Indeed. Let's look at some of those buttons having come through. Orn, LeBlanc, pretty standard, very strong picks over for Axis, and it's Aphelios off on the other side for the Hawks. Yeah, and it's a blue side Orn ban, which says to me that Axis were not willing to first pick that. It is a very first pickable champion, but with stuff like Soraka and Yumi, amongst other things in the meta, uh, there are a lot of first pickable worthy champions. We do see the Mordekaiser are removed as well. That's a bit more of a, a flavour pick, actually. We saw Unyan get a bit uh, thrown around by Ebby on that pick uh, before, but <laughs> yes, he, he, has, he has picked it though before. Yeah, indeed. So uh, yeah, has some favour for that pick. Indeed, and we'll see where, the, where they go these last ones. Vladimir taken off the board. Uh, Dasha and Ramane, I believe, both able to play that one to pretty decent standard. So that's taken out. We have seen a little bit more of Vladimir over the last week or so. Yeah, we've seen a little bit, and um, Dasha actually did play that pick before as well. He played it into uh, Sengoku when he, he did get solo killed by Affermen's Kennen, but he still had a very good game outside of the laning phase in that game in particular. So worthy of being removed there. And the last ban is Karthus, oh, aimed towards Hoglet in the jungle. We have seen Hoglet pick that up, so no surprise to see that off the board when it is so obnoxious when played well. Yumi is hovered yeah, and is locked in. Very strong support, a lot of healing. We've seen this become a little bit more of a pr uh, prevalence over the last quarter. And Soraka's still up. Yeah, well, well, what I'm wondering now is that if their next picks are Olaf and Soraka to make this 
the unkillable Olaf combo or something of the like, really. Because you can get that double heal uh, combo. But on the other side, it's MF and Set locked in for the Hawks. Both priority picks within their lanes. Set probably going to go to the top lane. And, of course, MF as the AD carry. But, again, we had this conversation on a number of other casts. Soraka gets a free lane kind of into Set. It's not like uh, Soraka's ever going to kill a Set. But you get a free lane, and th th that's potentially quite dangerous, especially yeah. if axes are going the way we think they are. But no, okay. that's a gangplank lock. Uh, though I do say I think Oinyan's not a bad gangplank, so I'm not, com not going to complain too much. Um, okay, so this is patch 10.3, remember. So, so this is actually, so this is pre Sidrani nerf, and also pre Akali nerf as well, if mm -hmm. they want to lock that in, which they did hover briefly. They're just rounding out a couple of other things. Obviously, it's the gangplank locks in as well. We talked about this numerous times on uh, cast and in our pl uh, podcast. That's pod number two. Mm -hmm. I do think the gangplank is a very good scaling matchup into the set. It survives lane, does pretty well in lane, actually, and then scales up to that team fight monster we know gangplank to be. It's actually Zaya locks in for the side of Axes. Not the AD carrier would have necessarily... Um, thought that they pick up but it is that self peel ad carry and works pretty well with the move speed boosts of you me being able to run forward and you know getting so many of those feathers down and it is a touch more safety of course uh is kind of on that b tier of ad carries maybe we'll put it not quite the the first pick it's not as pretty strong I'd, I'd, I'd bump well, it up to maybe an a tier no, that's a fair conversation um, particularly against the likes of mf and northless you you know you do have your ultimate to have a bit of safety uh, one of the problems with Zyra is that your ultimate is on a longer cooldown than a lot of the engage ultimates you tend to face in the current meta, and Nautilus ult is one of those, so we'll see if the Hawks can force out the Zyra ult with the Nautilus ult and then come back before it gets uh, gets its cooldown back up and get a kill. We are into the ban phase. Indeed. The second bans, though. Indeed, I was about to call that out, because there's a couple of interesting bans. Zoe is off the board for Gariaru, and Jarvan taken off the board for the likes of Tussle, who has... Kind of defaulted to that over the last yeah, few he games. Uh, and he didn't have a great week. Last week, one of those games was on the Jarvan, but that doesn't mean he's not a scary uh, scary player on that champion nonetheless. And what we see is a lot of blind pick mid lane is being taken away from Gadiaru. Uh, he has been stand out in the last week. He had a fantastic LeBlanc game, had a fantastic Lissandra game. Uh, but it is the Zoe and the Oriana, which are both very good blind picks in the mid lane, uh, removed from Gadiaru. And on the other side, it's Lucian removed from Ramone once again. Yeah and uh, very clearly don't want him to get his hands on that pick. Could be interesting to see what they pick into it, of course, but Elise now locked in very late into this draft. Yeah. Uh, uh, so Elise has been first pick ban worthy in previous LGL weeks, but now it's kind of falling a little bit lower down in the priority, and when you're against the likes of Olaf, I can definitely understand that. Olaf is eventually just able to run you down, and when you a have Soraka, a Yumi... It could be a Soraka mid still, remember, for the LJR. Absolutely. I'm thinking it'd be, I be. thought it was off the table, I realise it's not been banned, and of course it's still an option for the mid lane ninja played it, but they're thinking about a Victor here, and it is in. locked okay. in. Alright, okay, yeah, so we're going to have the Yumi Olaf combo anyway, it's not going to be paired up with Soraka for the double healing, but they do have another backliner in the form of Victor, so the Hawks are actually locking in the Aurelia, Aurelia. the first Thank Aurelia, you, the first Aurelia of the LJL um, spring split, and you know what, Aurelia is pretty damn good into Victor. You know, you can all in that guy at level six with ease in a lot of ways, and in fact, we might even see the set go to the mid lane against the Victor, and the Aurelia being put to top lane for Dasher. I it is that flex pick. Wonder where Set stands into Victor. I'd assume Victor has the advantage with the fact he can just throw out that siphon power for the advantage. We've not locked in in these positions quite yet, but uh, looking like it is going to be this way around. Well, so if you knuckle down to get the move speed, then. Uh, pin victor against a minion on the other side with a face breaker and get that stun actually the set can trade pretty well into that champion but it's going to be about uh your auto you know you're spacing in lane your positioning making sure you can run up and get that cc uh, but there are a lot of matchups here which are going to be quite interesting obviously the gp versus aurelia very spicy matchup as well so uh looking forward to some of these lanes and seeing how these players individually try and wrestle control of their lane away from the other player Okay, so we've got a Yumi Olaf draft on the one side with a little bit of little bit of additional damage. Well, fair amount of additional damage <laughs> actually. I I will rephrase in that Victor Zaya Gangplank triple carry threat behind that. Uh, on the other side, we've got a set mid lane. We've got an Aurelia top with an Elise looking to try and get some of these quite strong laners up, or at least volatile laners rather, up and ahead. Yeah, absolutely, and. So I, I do think that the Hawks can win this game from laning phase. If you put the GP and the Victor behind far enough in the early game, 
it gets very hard for them to stand in multiple lanes in this game because Aurelia can just run down most of these carries. I think that Aurelia will have problems with Olaf, obviously, able to uh, kind of walk through all the CC. But uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the micro outplays in this game. Uh, and yeah, some cool combos to watch out for as well. All right, game on tells the, says the stream and let's pay attention to see this early game. My eyes are going to be on Tussle and Dasher early on. Uh, it, we've I've talked about this before. If you're going to pick an Elise, you might want to pick a top lane champion that's worth diving with her. And that Elise Irelia combo onto a poor lonely gangplank could well be a good yeah. dive co uh, sort of option for the side of the Hawks. And, and the gold standard for this game will be whether the Hawks can get a kill onto the GP early game, force out the TP, and then freeze the wave in a really good spot for Irelia to be able to dash through that minion wave and get onto the gangplank as well. So that's what I'm looking for, actually, because the LGL's not typically been great for playing through uh, pot, top lane, but Irelia is one of those champions you do want to set ahead, get to the Triforce, get to your TM out as well. We'll see if it's actually a TM out or a Likes of Asterix. Um, but yeah, I'd like to see Unyan put behind on this gangplank. Does scale very well if the laning phase goes even, and that could be a problem for the Hawks if they don't manage to win through this laning phase. And that's been a thing for gangplanks over here in the LGL. A lot of them have had free rides in those early games, allowed them to get through to some mid games against perhaps matchups they really shouldn't have. Um, I'm, I'm thinking back to. Uh, Gosh, it was the one of the Gangplank games where it was into a Cho'Gath and uh, the Gangplank still hit like 8-1 and 7. I think it might actually have been uh, Ray Farkey possibly over for Burning Core last week. Yeah, it would have been against Nat. <laughs> yeah. So he's the only guy who's played Cho'Gath so far. Loves that champion. Back to... Uh... Champions of this game, obviously no Cho'Gath. I think we'd I'd like to see a little bit more of that champion, but actually seeing the Aurelia is pretty cool as well. We do see the jungle clears being started off. Hoglet looks like he's going buff, buff, and then to into another camp uh, after that, whereas the Elise uh, is starting on her full bot side click. Get that level three nice and early, and then seeing if she can affect the rest of the map. We'll end up on the top side of the map, uh, as Hoglet might do as well if he chooses to stick around there in this part of the clear. Yep, uh, a little bit more of that trading coming through. Using the Haymaker well is Ramane. Tussle now having gone for that full blue cycler, as you called. But Ramane looking to put down a ward. See where that Olaf is early. See what Aurelia can be doing early. Uh, probably not a bad idea because, of course, Olaf does clear pretty fast. And uh, him turning up for a counter gank would be a disaster if this Elise had gone top lane real early. Too. Yeah, absolutely. And Olaf, honestly, his goal this game is to just kind of farm up be in the right place to try and mitigate some of Elise's early game impact, but don't try too hard yourself. Your laners do scale really well. Zyra is a very good crit carry, and obviously, like, you've got some problems uh, with the MF having that same kind of uh, team fight role. Dash are actually going forward. He'd already used his Q, though, so no Q, Q reset available. Yeah, that's some of the potassium content of Gangplank's oranges to get out there. <laughs> yeah, and what we see there is that... Um, Aurelia has a, a, quite a long ma uh, auto attack range for a melee champion. Yes, has like does. an extra. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember the exact range, but it's 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 extra fifty maybe. 25? So it's like extra twenty five fifty something like that. Uh, it means that Aurelia can slip in those extra auto attacks in a lot of these trades, particularly when you start um, getting that extra attack speed up because of your passive as well. We do see a setup for an early dive here. They're teleporting onto the cannon minion. They actually. are. So Ramane's coming through. Tosso here to flash forward, not even throw the cocoon yet, just throwing damage out because they want to force as much Aww. out as they can, and that is Uinya being put in the grave oh that's so harsh uh i think tussle holds his cocoon really well flashes forward just for the extra bit of damage lands the cocoon anyway once the uh, gp is lined up against the wall flashes forward for the uh the flawless duet the e from aurelia gets the stun down after the uh the scurvy had been cleansed and this means that the gp loses wave to tower loses some xp and this is what i was saying about wanting to put that gp behind early now we'll see with both those summoners gone whether they can get the lane into a good position for aurelia to just run rampant in that matchup yeah you called it a flawless duet but i call that tri three people that was more of a triple <laughs> there and all the flashes, all the oranges in the world weren't going weren't gonna to get Uinyan out of that little dive. Absolutely not. However, Ramane does use the TP for that. does mean that he won't be able to uh, control his mid lane as well as he might have been able to with the free reset potential of that teleport. And uh, it, ooh, ooh, That's a good the hook there for the Nautilus, actually, yeah. Uh, but, of course, it is still a fair amount of healing available. And who takes the worst end of that trade in the end? Tussle, down here, though. Uh, gonna uh, hide and corporal to back away a little bit. 
I will be interested to see how Corporal does on this, Yumi. Of course, I had a lot of praise, we, but we all had a lot of praise for him last week on his playmaking, things like the Thresh. Had a good Braum game as well. But we'll see how this one goes and whether the Yumi, which is kind of so key to that Yumi-Olaf combo, can pull off some stuff. Well, so, so my worry in this game is that, so we saw the buff the Olaf composition from Sengoku last week, right? We saw that um, against DFM, and that didn't work out so well for them. But for me, that was because Olaf was the sole front line into a quite a high damage team. I look at the Hawks, and while they do have a lot of damage from the MF and potentially the earlier as well, their immediate burst damage does fall off as the game goes on. And when you're against the likes of a Yumi... Um, that's just a good uh, face breaker for Ironic, but Galio trading pretty well there. Puts down the Chaos Storm, even. Yeah, um, it's a decent Haymaker shield to force uh, to not take up as much damage, but of course, because Ramane had teleported out, doesn't hit that level 6 first. Didn't get the assist either, did Ramane. Uh, it was no, a, didn't. Uh, Ewan Nan did manage to get far enough away, I think probably with a barrel uh, speed up proc, actually. Yeah. But uh, we're seeing some good stuff here, much better from Tussle early game, and actually. Just that early pressure we wanted against this top lane where the gangplank is not getting the free ride and is actually down a significant amount of CS uh, and now And actually, as well. Tussle's looking to see if he can make some pressure top lane and force oh, this GP off this no. crashing wave in the top lane as well. Ramane is heading up as well, although Olaf will be there this time. So we'll see if they can try and stave off this dive. Well, it will be two level six solo laners to the level four of Uin Yan, who is having an absolutely miserable time up here. Olaf is here, though, trying to help his beleaguered top laner clear out the wave but uh even he's thinking mm, not sure about this he's a level up on his gp how has that happened i'm used to uh junglers being down on their solo laners at this point that says quite a lot considering uh, where the current met is at i believe we call this the direst experience this is uh i mean it's not quite the same as you know dying multiple times and losing all those many waves but it's looking pretty bad for the gp right now uh doesn't even have the ultimate to be able to clear out some of those waves when a um a dive does get threatened we'll be able to do that with another wave or two and at, at that point maybe this gp can kind of stabilize and uh try and get a little bit more wave clear down <laughs> yeah another one of those decent face breaker trades we were talking about into victor there uh and we're seeing a lot more proactivity out of this hawk side than we did last week it's looking uh they're up at 11 11.2k to 10.2k so they've got about a thousand gold lead it's not even 10 minutes yet so they're gonna be feeling pretty content with where this game's going as dasher goes in for another little trade here yeah and actually onion gets the better of that one uh he gets a good auto reset gets the passive down as well that true damage burn is actually ramane trading pretty well into this gang flag but it's not going to amount to too much i don't think axis would have wanted to fight over this early dragon which has been started up anyway they do want to reach their first items at least really you have stuff like the essence reaver to come in from the zaya you have uh, the triforce wanting to come in from the gp as well and also the hex core upgrades from victor as well you kind of need these to be around before you even think about fighting and also you know the olaf when he gets to his first item as well is pretty important yeah and of course while we're all talking about that the uh hawks do pick up an uncontested infernal drake first there which is a pretty big pickup for them using that early pressure they did have to secure that early objective yeah, and this is why I was mentioning that Axis really didn't want to oh, contend with that. Another trade here. It's a flawless duet into another bit of trading. But Hoglet is here this time, and here comes the cannon barrage. Dash is going to try and dash his way around this one. That comes out the Vanguard edge, but he's in a lot of trouble here. Not Ooh. enough damage, and Hoglet does get the kill there. Yeah, it's a good... Oh, actually, we see a dive on the other side of the map. This could be pretty bad for Axis here. Good read there on the Prowling Projectile. Had a feeling that the Elise was going to be there. Probably caught out on that pink ward over by the red buff. But that means that Dive aborted now in the bot side as Tussle uh, takes a little bit more poke for his name. But nice turnaround up in the top side as Dasher went aggressive without any knowledge of where Hoglet was. Yeah, and it's really good timing on the flash of Dasher as well. Obviously used that in the dive to kill off Eunian for the first blood. Didn't have it up to escape this uh, great uh, lane gang from Hoglet on the Olaf. who's had a, a good early game so far. Managed to farm himself up and get himself a kill participation. Yeah, I mean, though, no, it was looking to look a little dicey towards the end of that. There was a Conqueror stacked yeah. and a Vanguard Edge coming through. I was beginning to get a Dutch nervous, but of course, Olaf does more damage the lower health he is. And so the moment he has his cooldowns back up, there's a, a true damage smack that comes through and you take a lot more damage. But this time, Dash says, you don't have an ultimate. You don't have anything to stop me. But just takes two thirds of the health bar. Uh, he I thought he was going to keep going there. Yeah, he actually had a, yeah, he took two turret shots there. It does have the corrupting pot to keep himself a little bit topped up, but uh, yeah, maybe with, maybe you want to take one less of those turret shots to keep the trade <laughs> a bit more in your favor. Has built towards the tier mat, so, you know, has a bit more of that perma push potential allows to, you know, shove in those waves for early dives, uh, which they have been trying to do quite with quite regularity. 
Indeed. Uh, Hoglet here, though, having uh, spotted the attempt on the Rift Herald start, is just around to say, uh, no, you can't do that for free. Uh, I'm not sure what the second Drake is at this point. We'll have to keep an eye on what that one will be. But whenever that pans over, we will have a look. But look, let's have a look, check in with those lanes. We've got uh, a Sheen and the Tiamat up there for the Aurelia, for the Perma Shove, as you were talking about. There is a Sheen in response by the GP, but is still a little ways behind, at least in the CS department. Still down that level too. Bot lane's looking relatively even, though M Misfortune has had the more aggressive back with the double uh, damage items between the Caulfield and the BF Sword. Uh, and mid lane, once again, looking like pretty much parity. Yeah, and actually, going back to the mid lane, this is a good trade come in. Oh, actually, the showstopper used Yeah, that, that was quite nice, actually, but the uh, trade back is a fair amount. I like that pulling uh, Gary Aru out of the gravity field there to sort of, like, take that away and put him a little bit further up the lane than he would like. We actually might see a fight around this Harold, but it's already gone from the side of uh, the Hawks here. Oh, yeah, they they've found Ramane. Yeah, they're going, and they've got that damage coming in from the final chapter of Yumi to keep them locked down. Ramane caught up in, caught up in rotation, but the Hawks do pick up the Herald, but it's uh, a slightly lazy translation there, or transition rather, from the mid laner of the Hawks. Uh, yeah, so Ramane, I think, oh, so we actually might see a dive here onto Urnian. This is the Elise here as well with the Herald, but man, Urnian once again trading back pretty well with the auto attack cancel, gets the passive down, the trial by fire on the gangplank to trade pretty well onto this Aurelia. Yeah, it is a fair amount of damage Oof. that, and of course the grasp procs from those Qs, Gangplank is not strictly a ranged matchup, but does have those ranged trading options, right? But with that damage, maybe that's just all a bait. It's all a ruse. We'll find out. Nope, at least it's backed. And of course, Dasher is just going to drop out of that bush and see what he can do. Does still have the gold lead, though, does this Aurelia, for the time being, at least. Yeah, it does for, uh, yeah. It does for now. And both these champions are Triforce champions, and we know that is a very strong one item. Oh, God, just... go straight in. Never mind. The Vanguard has straight kill. What was that? I just came out of nowhere. That was like two thirds of the health bar to none. Uh, yeah, and that's the typical Aurelia 1v1. Wow, that really came out of nowhere. I was very surprised at myself. That's why I wasn't <laughs> shouting out in exclamation or setting up for it. It's a great committal of uh, the ultimate for Aurelia. A great committal of the flash to get out as well. Second kill of the game from Dasher. And we do see a ball in in the bot yeah, lane. Yeah, everyone is here. It is a 3v3. The feathers have gone down from high, but he's taking so much damage. That's a good flash, but is it enough? He's out of range. Just survives. Tussle's flashing forward for the venomous bite. Claims that one. Yeah, does flash forward, ends up with a kill onto the Zaya. Great play on both sides of the map from the Hawks, actually, winning both the top and the bot lane skirmishes, as this early game is going pretty well for them. Opened up to just over a 1k gold lead with the Herald still to use. Going to be able to get the rest of the plates here in this bot lane, probably. Well, we'll see. Of course, Olaf and Yumi is relatively hard to shove with the healing. Oh, Victor's going to Yeah, down, Victor is here. Going to try a re-engage, but where is Ramana? He's teleporting in, but Hoglet's slain the Elise already, and that teleports into a gravity field. Good turnaround from Axis. Yeah, and you know what? I'm actually not sure if anyone picked up any of the plates there. I think they must have done since I the gold I think I saw still... the uh, effects for it, so yes. Uh, hopefully so, but yeah, so that's the Herald Charge, uh, not really amounting to much. It does get the place, but the tower hasn't gone down. So first tower still available. Gariaru managed to make his way down here as well. Has now got the Death Ray upgrade from his uh, first Hex Core uh, purchase as well. And Hoglet once again finding another kill participation. Now it's two kills, one assist. Uh, been a part of all three of the kills from Axis so far. Cool. Yeah, just got confirmation from production. They did get the gold, uh, and that leads Hawks to just under a thousand gold lead. Actually, that lead is kind of shrinking a touch. Uh, they've been stuck at a thousand gold for a little bit, but pressure and level advantage is still theirs for the time being. Largely, though, Gariaru has now out leveled Ramane. Yeah, for now, and he's been farming very effectively on this Victor, has himself the tier 2 boots, has the sword boots, and one thing which I was going to talk about, but you know, there's too much, too much fighting to touch on everything, is that he actually went for the lost chapter before his first hex core purchase. Oh, did he? Man? Yeah, he did. He went for double Dorans into a little bit of uh, AP from the amp tone, built himself up the last chapter before getting that first hex core thing, just to give himself a bit more mana in lane, uh, particularly because he do have to trade quite a lot of mana into um, this set to make a dent into that HP bar. Well, Honey and Poo coming out to about a 10 CS lead in the bot lane, and uh, Dasher continues to put serious pressure down on this gangplank, even with that return kill. But uh, it's still a fairly close in terms of the gold game. In fact, it's less than 1,000 gold now, as we were saying, on the other side. 
Uh, we did just see Tussle pick up that second drake for the sides of Hawks. They've picked up that Cloud Drake. It is a Mountain Rift, I believe, which... Uh, Probably would be... Oh, they're looking for a dial. They are, maybe. and there's not a lot of health on this tower, but there are feathers in behind, and that's actually a good final chapter out from this Yumi to force the flash away from the misfortune. Yeah, and that's what I, I talked about a little bit in Champion Select, but so Zaya is really, really strong if you get that first auto down while your W is running, uh, running as well. Because your W, when you hit an enemy champion with its effect, that little extra damage feather thing which flies out alongside your other attacks, it's a good trade there, a good QE combo from yeah. uh, Hyde. It means that you get the extra move speed from, uh, towards enemy champions, and then when you have the zoomies as well, you get even more move speed, so you do end up becoming a bit of a um, super speed initial D moment as Zaya runs forward um, very, very quickly and allows you to run down the likes of the MF, even with a strut running as well. Uh, so once we get into these kind of 1v1, 2v2 situations, there are ways which uh, Hyde can put a lot of pressure down onto Honey. Yeah, and uh, Dasher oh, there takes a slow and a few turret shots as a result, but has that W there to mitigate some of the, le the damage there. But as Honey was pushing there for those last couple auto attacks on that tower in the bot tower, he get turned around on pretty hard there. And that QE combo you were talking about at the end, nearly taking him to a very dangerous point, actually. Yeah, but we do see that Honey has backed, does have a 10 CS lead as well, and the assist to his name. Two does mean that uh, he will be a little bit ahead of the Zaya and also picks up the first tower bonus as well to yeah. boot. Yeah, that turret has been begging to go down for the last couple of minutes. Finally goes down around 16 and a half here. And of course, Aurelia's actually done a fair amount of work on that top turret as well with the fact that Gangplank's been forced away a couple of times. But GP has his levels, has his Triforces a little bit safer in these lanes at this point, but uh, Gariadu and Tussle just running into each other here in the jungle. Yeah, so the Triforce completed for the GP, but honestly it's warning lights on for him still because of course the Aurelia has completed the Triforce as well. Even though uh, Dasher did sink that extra bit of gold into getting that TMA early, that's an extra, you know, 1500 gold, 1575 I think, or 1525, something like that. Actually, the Hawks group up and seeing if they can take a chunk out of this mid lane first before they start angling towards that second Herald. Yeah, but the Misfortune had to be very careful where she stood there because she has no flash. And a sped up zoomied Olaf running at you would have been uh, pretty tough to disengage from at this point. There's no yeah. <laughs> lantern to get Honey out of safety there. And uh, Hoglet will be taking after Pooh and would be very much in the mood for some Honey at that point. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think one thing which, uh, much, as much as these team comps do have there, clear strengths and weaknesses in terms of what we've already talked about. One thing which axes, axes have access to, which the Hawks don't really, is the fact that they do have the poke options in the long range death laser and also the prowling projectile as well. Whereas the Hawks really don't have that same kind of long range uh, poke attempt. They have the hard engage from the Nautilus if he lands the dredge line, but they don't have ways to really take much off the HP bars until the fight really starts in earnest. So maybe Axis can use that to leverage some pressure around these objectives. Yeah, the dive buddies of Nautilus, Set, and Aurelia trying to get real hard into the back plane of Axis versus some of that longer range poke and a very speedy Olaf. But we did see, of course, that second Herald. Uh, is that one's not Shelly, that one's Shirley. 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 That's, that's Shelly the Shirley. Uh, accepted nomenclature for <laughs> Second Herald, uh, as far as I'm aware. It was picked up by Axis. Uh, we'll see what they want to do with it. They've got a lot of high health powers to be pushing out, so it wouldn't be an auto turret to take. But if they can orchestrate a shove, they can definitely look to push down a turret. Potentially a mid lane one would not be a bad thought. Honestly, it, it's kind of nice just to have the Herald as this kind of sword of Damocles that Hawks have to take into account when they make plays. If they do commit too hard on one side of the map and the Herald is on the other side, they might end up losing a tower, which they didn't really want to let go of at this point in the game. That's what I can really see Axes doing with it for now. I don't see them being able to group up particularly well, and they're actually just going to ram it into the mid lane. It won't take it down from that HP but they will be able to get a little bit of pressure and a little bit of mid-prio as they go towards this dragon. They'll actually manage to hit the eye there, but the tower... Oh, I was completely wrong. Actually, the minimum damage from uh, from Shirley does actually take down the mid lane turret, so that's a very high-value Herald there. Indeed My mistake. It was. Yeah, that was right on the edge of how much damage it could do, but look at where Ramone is in this bush. He's managed to find himself a flank. Dash is on the other side. Uh... Hawks, or rather, Axis calling out Hawks 131 setup by putting the Herald in mid. 
forcing them to come in, and they get a turret in the mid lane, and they've also started up this mountain drake, but the hawks are here to contest. Oh, Dash is in a really good spot. Oh, that's a flash forward by Pooh, and he doesn't hit anything, has to stop one straight away, but the final chapter is there to try and throw some disengage. The Haymaker shield is pretty oh, big, but Ramane has taken a lot of damage, and that Vanguard's edge completely whiffed. How oh, Dasher dashes over the wall, but has to get straight back out, and Gary Aru now pushing forward, so so much damage gets a kill onto the Nautilus. Oh, Pooh fluffs the engage there on the Nautilus, goes to the flash dread line, ends up in no man's land on top of a, uh, Victor's uh, gravity field, does have the stopwatch to buy some time and gets himself out of the initial engagement, but falls down pretty soon after. It's the mountain drake over to Axis, and it's probably going to be the bot lane turret as a result as well. So, we see Axis starting up the objective. They have the positioning here, but Dash is in a position oh, to fight. No. Who doesn't land the initial CC. Even though the bullet time does do a pretty good job of zoning, Dasher misses the Vanguard's edge. This hugely powerful Aurelia at this point has to flash out after the exhaust comes down and has no further effect on this fight. And at that point, it's lights out for the side of the Hawks. Yep, that was a great series of plays from Axis there. And again, we have to praise the improvement in the sort of mid-game from this team. That was a good use of the Herald into a good Drake take, into a, a good turnaround as well. Yeah, and you know what's really scary after that? Is that we've got a 2-0-2 Olaf, who is going to be buffed out by Yumi, Yumi, who's now completed the Black Cleaver, so has relevant damage against the likes of this Aurelia. I reckon that an, uh, an Olaf Yumi might be able to 1v1 even this pretty scary Aurelia at some points in this game if the combos are landed correctly. Well, and I have to agree with you, and uh, Hoglet's doing pretty well for his levels as well as up at the level up, and has that level 2 Ragnarok for the increased sort of stats that gives you, even if you are losing some of your resistances with that, yeah. but uh, Aurelia is going to struggle to deal with that, I absolutely agree. Yeah, and you, I, I just said, oh, if the combos land correctly, I mean, like, what combos are there really to land from all of you? You press your buttons and you do kill a lot of people. It's more about trying to uh, avoid that flawless duet or the Vanguard's edge from the Aurelia, stop that key reset coming down, you know, all those passive marks being put down, allows you to reset that Q and get so much damage out of that Blade Surge. Um, well, you know, I've definitely, i kind of aware that Yumi must be reading a really good book because that final chapter is quite literally riveting. Uh, it is. <laughs> it is, and actually, uh, <laughs> oh no, it's the first pun of the day. Corporal actually oh, sat up, was sat, right. Come on, sat up one zero two. There. Actually, we see that Dasher is yeah, dashing he's forward, going forward, but the W is there. Does manage to disengage, oh, but Tusk takes a lot of damage. Has to flash the prowling projectile, and you're right. This Olaf Yumi combo is well and truly online. The one three one setup is pretty strong for the Hawks. I'll give them credit for that. Set with the Trinity Force, uh, and of course Aurelia with the Trinity Force as well in the separate side lanes. It's got a fair amount of shove, fair amount of agency in those side lanes. But when an Olaf can turn up and run you down those long lanes, I'm not sure how easy that's going to be to pull off the longer this game goes. Yeah, and actually this is one of the few games I wouldn't have minded seeing a Black Cleaver onto set. But the Triforce does give you so much extra stats to really start brawling with people uh so you're passive on set because you have that left right left right combo uh where you have effective sheen procs built into your kit anyway every other auto attack the more attack speed you have the more uh procs you go through which means that the trinity force give, does give you a lot of value just from having that uh, extra couple of brawling stats but uh, actually because you have so many ad champions on your team in the Aurelia and the MF trying to carry these team fights. the Black Cleaver would have also been an okay purchase this game. One of the few times I would have allowed it. <laughs> would have allowed it, but of course it's now looking like a three-man uh, posture towards this top side with Ramane under turret, but the Olaf and Yumi do run away. And we're kind of hitting to this mid-game lull at the minute while teams kind of figure out what they want to do next. Mountain Drake will be spawning in about a minute and a half. Hawks didn't pick up that last one, so they didn't hit Soul Point, so we're still a little ways away from any of those kind of uh, calamity moments for this game. But Dasher finds himself a pink ward and a red buff at the minute. Yeah, and we actually see a big incursion into oh, the bot lane ooh, here. Just a voice cocoon just hide there. Yeah, and actually, oh, we see the red buff go over to Dasher there, does manage to steal that away. And this is what happens when you have a very strong split pusher. It happens with Fiora when you get to a couple of items. Actually, we see the dredge line and the Ragnarok forced out of Olaf. Yeah, uh, that was a pretty well-timed Ragnarok there to avoid being uh, CC'd and put down. Uh, and that avoids any engage there in the mid lane. So we're seeing the two outer towers have been taken by the Hawks, but it's the mid lane tower forced by Axis in the mid lane. And that's kind of giving them at least some agency here. And of course, Zaya's really hard to punish, but 
That zoom out tells me that Hoglet and oh, Yumi Hoglet's are him. here. Look, a dash to take all the damage. That's a good Vanguard. Zedman takes so much damage. He's just done. Nothing he could do. I'm not sure that stopwatch was done. Wait, he's out. That gangplank all is trying, but it's a flash forward from Unyan to claim the kill in the end. But Tartar oh. goes down as well. No, no, no. That's two for none. Axis claim both the lives of the Hawks there. Oh, and actually, you see Hyde going straight on to Honey here as yeah, well. throwing out a lot of damage. Honey oh. gets destroyed by this Zaya and suddenly Poo's in no man's land. It's going to be a four for none over the course of this trade here. What a made game now. That's going to be barren, surely. It's a five. It, there's a massive gold swing over to the side of Axis. They pick up four kills, as you said. And actually, yes, this could very well be the Baron. There's 10 seconds left on release. They're actually committing the TP from the Gangplank as well. They have a lot of damage on this team. They might be able to burn this pretty quickly. Yeah, and suddenly that gold lead has disappeared for the Hawks in this Baron with these heavy carries of Olaf, Zaya, Gangplank, Victor, with a Yumi there to keep them all topped up. There, this Baron is disappearing. And can I just say, what a game from Hoglet so far, Sad at 4 0 and 3. This is the second time we've seen him shut down this Aurelia when she's been looking to abuse that 1v1, get into that side lane here. And we see Dasher, he sees an opening onto her and he really wants to. Uh, just pressure this advantage while the items are there. Gets down the uh, the first blade surge. Gets the uh, the the, uh, the blade the E stun down onto the gangplank as well. As I just miss my words and uh, Dasher misses his life and misses his friends across the map because uh, no one's really there to help him in time. Tussle comes down, but Olaf Yumi is such a disgusting combo. Olaf does love to be at those low HP in terms of damage, likes to be alive still though, and Yumi does help tread that boundary very well. And then Honey just has a big, big overstep in this mid lane. Oh, Hyde was... committing the flash, committing the ultimate, and Pooh is just kind of left to the winds here as well as he's taken down as a result of that mistake. And in the end, yeah, the Hawks pick up Mountain Drake, but they are down quite a lot of gold and a Baron buff, and suddenly this game is looking more and more untenable. Elise has picked up a Morella Nomicon to try and deal with some of this Olaf healing, which was obscene in that last engage. Yeah. But uh, I'm not sure that's going to be enough. And uh, we're going to have to see. Well, there is an execution calling as well. I do apologize for the misfortune. Maybe that bullet Just time picked up now. can Just picked up, yeah. maybe, maybe keep some of this healing down. I mean, we're looking at two double... Two summoner heal spells. We're looking at a Yumi who with which has got Athenes. Definitely understand that purchase. But I don't know whether it's going to be enough. We're looking at a 3,000 gold lead and a big shove to come yet. Oh, and Hoglet is just so strong here. It's uh, Hoglet with the Ardent Sensor themes, <laughs> Yumi backing him up as well. You see, those, that was actually Grievous Wounds on Hyde there, and the heal still, come, still comes through and mostly heals up Hyde from that chunk. Uh, this Yumi is being very, very high effectiveness at this point in time. You know, while this is happening, this Victor is actually scaling up super well. As we see another, another problem, damage, I think off. Honey has to flash out, just takes so much damage from an incidental Q from that Olaf. This combination is utterly disgusting. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I faced it a couple of times in my solo queue. The last time uh, I faced an Olaf Yumi, he got two pentakills. It ruined my day, ruined my game. <laughs> Uh, and it's certainly, oh, it's certainly uh, ruining the Hawks game right now as well because Hoglet has been putting on a masterclass of how to counter gank, be in the right posi position at the right time and still stay relevant into the mid and late game as a jungler. Indeed, but oh, we're looking at the they found a decent flawless unit. That's a good bullet time as well, but Hyde manages to get out of the way of a lot of it with that Featherstorm. But in comes Dasher, doing a lot. He's got a top of that Zaya, but Hoglet is still there doing so much damage. Look, Ramone is here, but it's so much damage. Victor's destroyed everyone in the back lines, a double kill, but Ramone is trying to 1v3. Can he do it? No way. Takes so much damage, even with the stone plate running. It's going to fall here, finally. And that was a good, decent attempt. They tried to the Hawks, but it's four for two in the end there. <laughs> and finally, Gaudiaru gets a chance to say time for Gaudiaru, captain of Gondor, to show his worth. Has been scaling up this whole time. Level 17 heading into that fight. Has himself two and a half completed items. Uh, one of those being the Hex Core. And he runs in. And even though the Olaf goes down, this super carry Olaf, uh, the Victor cleans up shop. And they'll be taking an inhib and two towers for their worth. That was, I understand why the Hawks went for that. I do. But of course, you've got to remember that was just a lot of damage from that Victor. And it's looking to me like the Hawks are kind of out of this game at the minute. Let's look at this replay. Uh, Onion kind of just uses his face there to uh, take a lot of damage. Does get the ultimate down though. Actually does quite a bit of damage through this fight. And Dasher does a good job getting down onto Hyde, onto the Zaya, who even though does manage to use the ultimate there, 
uh, doesn't manage to get out of that fight. At the end of the day, it's it's a four for two, actually. And you know what? That's one of the better ways that fight could have gone, which is the real scary thing for the Hawks there. They have been pretty outscaled at this point now, and they're also down six thousand gold and while i've said that after that fight gadiaru i think he actually one shot to death cap what that is obscene that's three thousand six gold just uh, three thousand six hundred gold just dropped on the counter and said give me your biggest hat and give me all that ap and you know what the biggest thing about this is yumi takes a lot of stats from the person that she sat on victor has a huge amount of ap and now that means that these prowling projectiles are going to be doing some damage Yep, more like depth charges at that point. But of course, <laughs> uh, looking at it, it's just like Ramane has to sort of like run away from a screen away from this like a tiny cat on a book. Terrifying creature book. indeed. Uh, but of course, Mounted Drake spawning in 30 seconds. Can the Hawks find a way to contest it? They can find a way to steal it even. Maybe they have a win condition. They, you know, have got the three Drake stack. Maybe that's something they can do. Well, I'm actually not sure if Axis even need to go for this dragon, to be honest. I don't think they necessarily want... I mean, they can force the fight and then try and force it into something else. I think what they'd really like to do is force Mountain when Baron is alive. Make sure that the Hawks wants to commit to it. See if they can get a couple of kills. Then head over towards the Baron. Then head over to close the game. They're actually just going to rush it on spawn. As the Hawks are not there in time, didn't have any of the vision control. We can see, actually, the blue quadrant of the Hawks uh, jungle has been completely lit up with wards. Uh, and that means they get themselves up to two mountain drakes. And actually, you know what? This is a pretty tanky Olaf uh, with those extra stacking resists in there as well now. Yeah, and of course, with the, that guardian angel is just going to be another life that the hawks have got to find some way somehow to get through. So oh, yeah. behind all the healing, yeah. and he comes straight back. It's time for round two. It's uh, not looking all that positive for the hawks, but... I mean, they have got some options. Aurelia's got her own Guardian Angel, and she was pretty close to getting a double kill onto Uinyan and Hyde as well. So maybe she can do something. Has got uh, enough damage. <laughs> We've got a, a pretty tanky set. We've got a, a Misfortune who's got her double crit items and nearly a Bloodthirster, but... On the other side, we've got triple item carries in a Victor and a Zaya. We've got a Trinity Force Essence 3 of a Sterax Gangplank. And we've already talked uh, to death about this uh, Olaf and his item. So it's looking pretty dire for the Hawks. But the game's not over yet, and we have seen Axis make some mid-game and late-game mistakes but yet. Th the problem for me is that, well, I mean, effectively, you ha first off, how do Hawks win a team fight? Maybe it's Dasher popping up, getting some kills early, but now you have a GA to contend with. You have a stopwatch on the V to contend with. And also amongst that, if Victor gets two skills off on you, I'm pretty sure you die. You Victor is so, so strong right now. And they're actually just going to force the Baron straight off here. They are melting it. Yeah, it's just going, but at least Tussle is here. Maybe he can get over this wall. He's got the repel. Doesn't have vision though, so but Ooh, that's a pretty decent barrel over the back there. Does about a third of Honey's HP before he can heal it, but that's a decent bullet time. The best oh, it's a stone! It! What? And How has she done it? It's a stone. How has she done it? And we see this actually a lot from Misfortunes. The bullet time comes in. Even if you try and peel off that objective, the bullet time forces the objective to go down pretty low. They do lose a member off this, and we'll see actually if this means they lose an inhibitor as well. It's a good Godlike steal from the Elise. Actually, a very hard smite fight to win there when you do have such a strong Olaf on the other side. But this might end up the, uh, being a full inhibitor. Might even be like two inhibitors down as the top wave pushes in as well. Yeah, well, the inhibitor and the turret's gone, so uh, that is at least something for Axis, but a breath of fresh air, uh, a reprieve from a game that had been spiraling out of control for the Hawks. Yeah, and I mean, this is what I mean. I was gonna say, how do Hawks win a fight? How do they get back into the game? Well, this is the way you start it, right? You start off with a uh, with a Baron steal. The problem is, there's nothing like an Elder Drake to be stolen right now, and that's what really makes you win fights. This is the problem which the Hawks are gonna have is that even if you win these Baron fights, you don't win the ensuing team fight. There is so much damage coming out of the Axis team comp. So we see here the vision gets cleared out pretty quickly, uh, but they do still retain some vision of the HP bar. They see it going down, and then they layer the bullet time in, means that the objective does fall down into smite range. And uh, actually, I'm not even sure. Tussle who's... didn't smite. No, Tussle did smite, I believe, but it just was a bit of a miss smite, and then the bullet time finished it off there. I didn't oh, actually wow. see Tussle. I... Yeah, I know. I saw Hoglet smite go down. That's what it he was. He missed smite smite, it. Yeah. He, uh, he missed-smited it, and then the bullet time finished the objective. So a slight miscalculation by the Olaf there. But honestly, for me, 
It doesn't mean that Axes are any less in control of this game. They still outscale. They still have massively fed carries. And Hawks still need to win a team fight at some point in this game if they want to close it, uh, you know, bring it back towards a vic victorious state. It is just that, but they've got a bit of a hook. They're looking for a fight, but the Ragnarok is popped. That's a very fast Olaf. It is, but it is also the Ragnarok popped as well. However, at this point in the game, when you do have built up, you know, up to uh, level 15, have the Black Cleaver CDR as well, does mean that Ol uh, Olaf's ultimate won't be on the longest of cooldowns at the very least. Probably going to be up for this Mountain Dragon as it spawns. Yeah, already a third of the way back up again, but as you said, Mountain Drake will be spawning again in about 50 seconds, and maybe this will be another point of contention. Uh, mid lane inhibitor is down, but that bot lane inhibitor did respawn for the Hawks. So maybe they want to look to contest this. It would be giving them the soul. Uh, it would be giving them that shield, which would give them another edge in the fights that are a bit tricky at the minute. But Ramonate does get out. Yeah, the Empowered Recall means that uh, Set manages to make his back way back home to Mama. Uh, it's actually got himself up to three and a half items now, most of them being tank items. Does have a Mountain Drake on top of that as well to boost those resist. But at this point in the game, I don't think Victor gives a damn about your resistances. He does have a whole heck of a lot of damage there. She, well, certain, well, he certainly does. Look at that. Uh, he's got Machine in there as well, along with a stopwatch. Definitely going towards that Lich Bane for more empowered auto damage. Uh, five seconds, and this Rift Herald is, sorry, Rift Herald, Mountain Drake is on the Rift, rather, but we're looking for another engage here. Ramane spotted with that Death Laser over the wall, but we're looking at Pooh finding a decent engage. Final chapter's gone in, but that's a fantastic face breaker, but the Suprex isn't bad either, and that's a good bullet time, but there is still no oh, Victor Garrier is gone! Garrier is gone on repeat, the Hoglet's taking a lot of damage, and Dasher, GA popped, but Uenyan stuck on the other side. Let's see how much damage they can do. Yumi here does damage, but they finally get the shutdown on that gangplank. Pooh goes down as well, and of course, there is so much damage to be- Hides alive! Hides survives with Yumi's help and suddenly this is all going wrong. The Yumi healing is obnoxious and Honey disappears oh. but not before oh. deleting Hyde in the back end of that fight. But that Olaf Yumi combo cannot be stopped. The healing is too strong. And it oh. is a 5 for 3. And even though Hoglet goes super low in that fight, the GA doesn't get cut through and that means that Yumi has a safe target to keep attached through in that entire fight. Actually, Corporal sat at 1-0 and 15 on the cat book. That fight was a massacre. So many people falling down left, right, and center. We see that the teleport is committed from Dash here, but at the start of this fight, Axe is trying to put themselves into a good position to try and start poking out, but the dredge line does land in this fight pretty early. Ramane uses the blast plant to get right into the thick of things, but the showstopper doesn't actually carry Gadiado that far. At the end, it doesn't actually matter. It carried it to the bullet time anyway after that stopwatch, and then also a lot of damage from Dasher too. But Hyde is alive. Hogler is alive, and Unyan does manage to buy quite a lot of time on the gangplank as well. And then at this point, you know, they just have the better consistent damage left with the Yumi still alive to keep them propped up. I mean, it's a really good shout from Honey to at least finish off Hyde at the end of this. Does get a good auto attack reset with the Q, has uh, that huge amount of AD built up, and does mean that they uh, uh, do staunch any pushing potential after that fight was uh, done and finished with. Yeah, and uh, interestingly, Victor has sold his stop broken stopwatch now for an Oblivion Orb, which I'm not sure about this late into the game. Uh, I think it means that you have more of a chance to one-shot Honey. Maybe yep. that's the play. And also, there's no there's no MR on the Aurelia as well. I Very don't true. think you're looking to cut through the front line. I think that you probably might want to leave that to the likes of Hyde and Hoglet, maybe. And then uh, try and one-shot those carries if you find an opening yourself. Yeah, but Axis now up to Soul Point themselves, and they've got three Mountain Drakes, and when Hawks are struggling to even get through one GA at this point, all those extra resists have got to be making them tear their hairs out, their hair out. It's still, uh, you know, a pretty close gold game in a lot of ways. I mean, it's about 5,000 gold, but this late into the game, that means less uh, and less. I mean, it, it was actually larger at some point. Gadiardo is actually walking to Ramonet, but check it, checks with the laser there. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's a close call. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, they are more in the fact that it's late behind. into this game, and actually, well, it, we're not. it's not as much as it may once have been 10 minutes ago. Yeah, but then, like, you look at, like, the items and where they're coming in, and, you know, there's three items on this Olaf, alongside his jungle item as well. He's really fed, does have the GA sat at 7 and 1, and eight is Hogler. Standout game from the jungler of Axes, and he's really just uh, 
putting Tussle to the sword this game on the Elise. No real impact in this game. Um, outside of, outside of the first couple burst. of dives mm. to get Dasher mm. ahead. But then the Axes have managed to survive to the point where this Olaf is running over another team fights. Engage, we see another one. But the Ragnarok is popped. So is the final oh, chapter. Poo takes a lot of damage. But here is Ramane in the back line waiting to work so some of these things out. Has got the Haymaker though for a shield. Suplexing back in though is this... Uh, Set does fair amount of damage, but so does oh, the Yumi healing and the Chaos Storm is down. But that bullet time is a bit meh, and Gary Aru just silences people on the other side along with the Olaf. So I said a little while ago, if two skills land onto Dasha from this from Gariaru, you will die. Dasha goes down, as does Ramune. Solar laners from the Hawks are down. There's no bullet time to really try and force a steal this time. Axes walk away with a two for none and the Baron this time. This might even end up being the death push as they'll look to try and crush those inhibitors in the mid and bot lane once again. Well, solar lane to the Hawks are still down for 13 plus seconds and that means there is a push available. Mid inhibitor, bot inhibitor are exposed and it is going to be 5v3 for the foreseeable future and Axis, I think you're right. I think they are going to look to try and end it here. At least they're going to be taking the mid lane and yep, they're pushing on. Honey is here but has no bullet time it's tussle here with no wave clear it's poo here who's a bit squishy and gangplank just oranges oh, away the cocoon. but yeah the cocoon the chaos storm is back up the repel comes out the but that's just, just over. gg just destroys that axis go two and five now taking down the hawks in actually pretty good fashion there they take a pretty massive scalp there actually it's a big game to take it maintains their momentum after their strong last week and we're going to bring it back to Mass Swan for our post-game thoughts there. Well, um, Axis are playing like a top-level team. <laughs> they just decided to just go 0-3, like, in their first three weeks. That was phenomenal. That was, honestly, a very strong performance all game round from Axis, from the draw phase through the early mid-game all the way through. Congratulations to them. Commiserations to the Hawks. Yeah, and I have to say, for me, this shows you have to ban Yumi on red side. Do not let her get first picked. We've nope. seen a little bit through the other regions. Yumi's back. She's bigger than ever and has some pretty nice carries to attach herself to there in that team composition. Axe is very nearly through that game. True. In some ways, I think that they still had the lead, but it showed they didn't have a quite as firm a hand, hand on the rudder as they could have done. Those but late well, game decision making, we saw punish them versus Crest Gaming last week. But they had a very good scaling team comp, which did bail themselves out. And Hogler, what a game on that Olaf. Quality stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to echo that as well. I think Hogler had a great game. So did Corporal on that Yumi doing yeah. his job pretty well. Undefeated, that didn't, is... didn't die. Yep. Yeah, yep. <laughs> that, that duo is so obnoxious. Um, and like also with the carries that are backing up, that's a gangplank, a victor, and a Zaya. Not exactly low damage mm. threats, right? Uh, so the fact that they were kind of kept safe by the Olaf and the Yumi and were able to put out so much damage was, was pretty spectacular. On the other side, the Hawks, I, I mean, their draft in isolation looked pretty okay. But when it was versus that Yumi, they just couldn't do enough. They couldn't get through enough of their HP. I mean, it was full AD, right? Which is a thing i mean it didn't come up at all and i guess like axis didn't really draft a comp to kind of respond well against that so it didn't really matter but no. it was a thing yeah i think it does matter for the olaf i guess because i mean it, it only affects your front line really when you have a mono damage type uh and olaf did manage to build into uh ranjuin zantabi didn't actually <laughs> mention that in game of course because uh, there were plenty of other things to talk about Fights yeah, every that... three minutes it felt yeah. like anyway <laughs> Yeah, and the GA also gives you some armor as well. Mm. So actually the Olaf alongside like two or three uh, Mandrakes at the end of that game was very tanky. And then also getting heals from the Yumi. Very mm. good composition from Axis. I approve. Well, that was a stellar first game from Axis. And we're going to see them again in our second game. Following this one right after our break, it's going to be Sen Goku Gaming versus Axis. Please join us right after the break. <laughs> 